Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the CA APM Global User Community June meeting. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now turn today's call over to your host, Manish Parikh. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Manish Parikh. Uh, I'm the president of the CA Global User Community, and welcome to our June uh, 2013 webcast. Today, uh, what we have is a, um, a panel of uh, product managers who will be presenting an overview of CAPM version 9.5. Uh, we have the fortune to have among us uh, Mark Cheney and Tim Smith. They are both the CAPA product managers. And today, during the webcast, they will focus on uh, three main uh, aspects of APM, uh, application behavior analytics, uh, new web-based user interface, and browser response time monitoring. Uh, just a couple of announcements before I hand it over to Mark. Um, number one, uh, for your Q&A, if you can please uh, post them under the Q&A section of the webcast, uh, WebEx rather than the chat, that would, that would really help us out, facilitate uh, your questions quicker to the panelists. Um, also, the product team of APM would like um, the community to take a brief survey, and as a token of their appreciation, appreciation you will be automatically entered into the drawing for, for a $500 gift card. And for your convenience, we have already pasted the URL into the chat, so feel free to um, copy it down or click on it and take the survey at a, at a convenient time. Um, one last thing that I wanted to mention, there has been a lot of questions on the community regarding replays for the webcast. For those who you know either wanted to um, watch the webcast again or weren't able to attend. The replay are posted on the community web page under the webcast archives. And if for some reason you're not able to get to those, uh, you can definitely reach out to the board and we can definitely help you guys out there. So with further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, Mark Cheney. Uh, Mark? Uh, Thank you, Manish. Um, so, hi, hi everyone. My name is Mark Sine, and I will be walking you through uh, two of the three um, topics that Manish had mentioned, uh, so the new web UI and browser response time monitoring, and my colleague uh, Tim Smith will walk you through uh, application behavior analytics. So from a web UI um, perspective, uh, just wanted to you know share with you guys that we've we've completely redesigned the UI in our our 9.50 release. Uh, we're using the latest and greatest HTML5 and JavaScript um, technologies to be able to continue to offer that rich data analysis and monitoring capability via um, a web web based interface. Um, sorry, before I keep going, I just wanted to bring to your attention that there is a, a polling section on the right of your screen where uh, just asking a couple of questions about our audience or attendees to better understand the technologies that you use today. Um, and also uh, the next the, the follow-up poll will be around um, the browsers you use so that we make sure to optimize uh, the experience for those browsers. So please take the time to, uh, to answer the polls. It should show up on the, the right side of the, uh, the screen that you're looking at. So just continuing on uh, from a web UI perspective, uh, again, everything has been redesigned in terms of uh, the, the web application and communication framework being used to really optimize um, the ability to analyze and visualize data over both LAN and WAN uh, networks. Because um, we understand that a lot of our triagers, diagnosers, and monitoring users uh, do use uh, our, 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 um, our consoles from from the distributed areas uh, around the uh, around the world. So, um, the primary targeted personas for our web UI are the triager and diagnosers. We've mobilized um, about 75% of the of the content required, the workflows required to be able to uh, satisfy some of these users. Uh, the primary uh, targeted use use cases, as I mentioned, monitoring, triaging, and, and diagnostics. 
some of the major enhancements um, from a web uh, UI perspective is really that, that web experience, that, which I'll, I'll show you in a demo and, and, and next. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, things like, like bookmarking uh, makes it a lot easier for you to share uh, in context, right, both from a time and location context. Um, problem areas within uh, the technology. So as you share that with a broader audience uh, within your organization or in tickets, you're simply now sharing a, a link and you're getting away from having to document or, or, or give you the step-by-step -step process that you would have to in, in the workstation um, uh, in order to uh, bring the person to the right area where you had a problem in your environment. All right. Uh, we'll talk about the home page and the dashboarding technologies. As I mentioned, everything is all HTML5 uh, uh, free form dashboards. We no longer support the need for any types of plugin, no flash, no silverlight. And that was intentionally done so that we can, moving forward from a really, you know, enhance our development velocity uh, and, and ultimately support a much broader set of platforms and, and mobile devices. All right, so what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and uh, share my desktop here. All right, Manish or Mary, can you confirm that you are seeing my desktop? Yes, I'm seeing okay, it. Great. Excellent. So, so here what you see is, uh, so as a, as a, a non-subject matter expert, uh, a triager or, or a, a monitoring user, um, you will see the first time that you log into the ATM web view uh, is a tab navigation. You see the time window to continue to be able to analyze live and historical data. Um, the first tab that does come up is the home page. As I mentioned, everything is bookmarkable. So you, there, there is um, the deck and, and, uh, will be shared with you, and at the end of the deck, you'll also notice the bookmarking syntax that I've provided so that you're familiar with it. Um, you, you are able to see, so in the home page, the primary uh, objectives of the home page is to summarize three core areas of APM, uh, the business transactions that are being identified for, for end user experience monitoring, the application components, that is the automated discovery of all components that make up these business transactions, and ultimately all the risks and alerts that, that are triggering in your environment. So from the business transaction perspective, what you're seeing is, again, all the named transactions that you have in your environment and ease uh, of access to be able to configure these environments. So whether you've already set thresholds or you want to set new thresholds, simply clicking on the edit icon, you can simply set thresholds for whatever uh, key performance uh, indicators that you have to really simplify the management of these, um, these thresholds. Below the tabular view of these business transactions of your environment, sorted by status initially, what you see is the top 25 slowest response times and all the errors installed in your environment. Each one of these data points can simply, by hovering on them, you can simply click on these data points and uh, drill into that specific metric uh, in the environment. Okay, so clicking on it, you will get to see the metric and all the underlying application servers that are responding to this metric here. So you'll notice that one of the key values of the home page, again, is, is an, uh, an automated, uh, you know, out-of-the-box dashboard meant to summarize the transactions, the application components, and alerts in your environment, and making it easy for you as an end user to simply drill down and, and click through either by managing, clicking through in the transaction, a business comp and application components that make up these transactions, or any of the alerts as well. So as an example, if you have predefined alerts in your environment, you'll get to see how many are actually triggering the danger threshold, caution threshold, and the normal threshold. And what we do is we sort the top horse uh, transactions in your environment in, in this little panel here. And as I mentioned, everything is linkable, so you can simply just click on it, and you will go directly into that alert definition. Okay. So you don't have to guess and have to search to find out where it is. Simply drill, on, drill into that transaction, which is a summary of, of metric groupings. Uh, and it's easy for you to then you know, go back on the data point and uh, simply drill down on it. Okay, so that, uh, that is our home page. Um, so one of the things from a, uh, a triager, um, so the, the day in the life of a, of a triager, one of the things you want to be able to do is quickly isolate root cause of a problem. 
So in this case here, uh, we notice that you know it's easy for you to isolate that there is a transaction that is taking much longer than the other one. We did have a, a threshold set, so you see that status that is uh, causing an issue. You do see a component that is also slowing down, right? This exchange web, as a non-subject matter expert, as a triager, right? I may not know the correlation between the two of them. So one of the logical steps that we want people to gravitate towards is our triage map. So ultimately, by clicking on the transaction, in this case that is performing poorly, I can see uh, the linking of that transaction with the underlying component. In effect, uh, effectively, you can see here that the ShopQ product is all, also using this TextChange web component. One of the things from a health standpoint, right, what you want to be able to do is quickly characterize the behavior of that transaction. Ultimately, you're seeing here that there's been a, uh, a degradation in response time over, you know, 16 seconds in response time seems to be a constant threat, uh, trend in this environment. One of the things I may want to do here is just go back historically, find out when the problem started. And we're, uh, what you see here is that at a certain point in time, at about 7.30, we're starting to see a lot of degradation in response time, which likely results to, into uh, unsatisfied customers. You see a degradation um, in responses per interval. In this case, you know, you're, you're just putting through a lot less transaction. And uh, what you're seeing at the same time is um, concurrent invocations have gone up. Errors, there's been a couple little errors here, but certainly not a consistent problem from a characterization standpoint. But you are seeing that the stall count certainly increased at that same point in time and uh, continued being an issue in the environment. So the goal here is at a glance, right? Much easier drill down, starting from the home page, getting into better understanding the dependency and linkages between business transaction application components, and then helping you characterize at a glance across all your application that make up your application cluster and ultimately provide you that, that, that end user experience data or that to, for, the, for those transactions that our end users are doing, quickly providing um, the different application servers that are making up this transaction. So here I quickly see that you know, one of my application server hosts is in a, a, an issue, having a problem, I'm um, seeing a concurrency gone up, the errors are gone up, going up, and also seeing some stall counts. So as a triage, as you'll notice in this release, in the APM 9.5 release, through the home page, this automated dashboard, we've made it simpler for people to get access to that rich uh, data that we're collecting, um, both auto-discovered for from the application, uh, the, the deep diagnostic perspective, and ultimately linking that back to that end user experience. So simplifying that whole uh, navigation and workflow. Um, ultimately here I can drill down as a triager, but ultimately what I'd likely probably do is, is assign this back to my development team to more analyze and diagnose the root cause of the environment. So at this point here, what I'd like to uh, bring back um, the workflow into a couple of other areas. Um, so from a console standpoint, these are all the dashboards that we continue to support. Um, as I mentioned, if you look at the, um, the browser response, the, the browser uh, URLs, everything is bookmarkable, all the dashboards, so it's easy for you to share this using your uh, corporate instant messaging tools or emails or in tickets so that people can actually understand where are the problems within the environment or if you want to send them back to a specific point in time or a location. Okay, very important to, to note. Um, we continue to support all the drill down, a lot of the rich widgets, uh, graphs in our dashboards, so you can continue to build these dashboards and visualize them with our um, APM UI our web UI. All right, so uh, one of the things that I'd like to bring uh, now to, to your attention, what I'm going to do is going to skip over to browser response time monitoring. Um, Tim will show more of the, uh, the workflows in the, the UI. So from a browser response time monitoring perspective, I'll just skip, skip forward a couple of things. Actually, before I do that, I just want to bring um, to your attention some of the web view performance. Uh, so from a highlighting guidelines perspective, uh, we do support uh, 50 concurrent users that we've been able to test on the hardware specifications that we have, which I'll talk about in the next slides. We've also tested over 2,000 dashboards, over 50 plus management modules. Um, we had some customers that were very um, dashboard centric, uh, you know, have m many different teams within their uh, organization. Uh, certainly it hit some of the um, um, upper boundaries of a performance limitation from a workstation standpoint, it would, it would take a long time to load up these, these dashboards and views from the console, from the workstation. This is not an issue anymore for, for the web view. We certainly can, uh, we can support, you know, well over, you know, uh, you know at least you know, 2,000 dashboards with the specifications we have, and it, and it loads up, uh, you know, instantly. 
From a live metrics perspective, um, this is an example of some of the dashboards that we built, 20, 20 uh, widget, 25 metrics per dashboards. Uh, ultimately, you know, adding more widgets, adding more metrics, uh, what we notice is that, you know, you're, you're going to get into more of a browser rendering limitation. No issue with um, uh, the web server or the, the APM cluster. From a service side perspective, what you're noticing is that the more widgets, the more metrics, the more live subscriptions that you have, you're going to be more memory bound. So allocating more memory uh, to, the, to the base configuration would certainly help you uh, sustain more, uh, more metric subscriptions. Uh, browser performance, um, certainly well, well known in the industry. IE8 is the slowest browser and Firefox is, is much, uh, much faster. Um, as I mentioned, we support um, IE8, IE9, uh, Firefox 12 and 13. We did put a lot of investment in IE8. We do understand that a lot of our customers are using it. Um, it's certainly not, not the most optimized browser. IE9 is much better. Uh, also, work in, it works quite nicely on, on, on other browsers such as Chrome and, um, and Safari. All right, so uh, the optimized deployment model does recommend putting WebView on a dedicated server, uh, but as long as you have your mom properly, properly sized up, you can deploy your WebView on your mom. These are the sample configurations that we put, uh, we put together for our performance test, and this will, support, uh, this will easily support 50 concurrent users and a number of 20, 25,000 live metric subscriptions um, in, in your environment. One of the things that I want to bring to your attention is we're continuing to migrate a lot of this workstation capability to the web view. Uh, important thing is, is that a lot of this new capability, such as the home page and, and what you will see with uh, the, the demo from Tim around the application behavior analytics, this capability will not be supported in, in the workstation. Um, so we'll continue to involve only the, 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 the web view. We'll, fix, we'll continue to fix any, any major sev one sev 2s on the workstation, but we will not involve the workstation. So one of the things that we're asking for your help with is helping prioritize the remaining capability that you would like uh, to see in, um, in, in the web view in the new UI, the APM UI, so please um, go ahead and, 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 and log in when you get a chance for this survey um, and uh, provide us that feedback. Uh, from a uh, known challenges perspective, um, if you are using IE8 and IE9, uh, some IT shops seem to be um, um, blocking, or not blocking, uh, anything that's not considered a trusted website will pop up with this, this uh, message alert. What it does is it actually brings your IE uh, mode into IE7. So what happens is that some of the content will not render properly, such as images and everything else. Uh, this is a known limitation or, or known issue with IE. Uh, there's documentation around this. Uh, ultimately, what you need to do is um, you need to change your browser mode and, uh, it, to, a, to a, an IE8 or IE9 compatibility view, and it actually documents how to do so. The other option is to have your IT department make the APM WebView URL in your environment as a trusted URL, and that should uh, get around this issue. All right, so uh, what I'll go ahead and talk about now is browser response time monitoring. So browser response time monitoring uh, really is about determining that performance visibility in that last mile of that transaction. So anything before uh, your data center. So as you're processing these transactions, you want to be able to understand what is that end user experience like on that browser, right? Whether you're using IE, Firefox, Chrome, et cetera. So ultimately what we do is we collect all that performance data from a browser perspective, which also helps you better understand some of the response time of the content delivery network required to be able to render that page that you're actually serving to your end user. So what we're doing is we're providing this uh, capability to be able to uh, analyze that browser experience. You'll see some of the out-of-the-box dashboards to be able to quickly isolate some of these um, problem scenarios or problem issues that are impacting um, that, that, uh, that browser from um, accessing your websites. So ultimately, from the, from the root cause identification uh, through, the, uh, through the drill down through um, uh, the, the actual out-of-the-box dashboards or directly through the investigator window, you can actually drill down into all these URLs that are being monitored with uh, BRTM, be able to quickly isolate page load time, browser render time, DOM construction time, as well as um, page round trip time issues in your environment. So really making it easier for you to better understand that, you know, from an application server standpoint, everything may be looking great, but ultimately 
end users are still complaining because it's taking a long time to render pages. And it may be due to the content being served up to these end users and how, how the content actually renders in the, uh, the browser. So this will give you some of that, those indicators um, that you may not, that visibility that you may not have had uh, in the past in your, in your environment. So just to give you an idea of some of the breakdown of these transactions, so what you see here is um, uh, click from the first user to be able to unload the first page, and then uh, the, the, the resolution, cache, DNF, TCP, and then ultimately what you're seeing here is the request time, the app server time, and response time that will be captured in the page round trip time. And then you'll see a separate timing uh, for the DOM construction time, and then you'll see um, the full uh, page load time, sorry, browser render time, and then the entire time, the page load time. So these are all the types of metrics that we are collect collecting with the browser response time monitoring. Everything uses uh, dynamic JavaScript injection to be able to inject these pages from the agent, uh, and we'll be able to provide that rich data for you to further, that further help you um, analyze, characterize, and isolate some of the root cause of the problems. So just to give you an idea of how browser response time is working, uh, one, uh, we do a JavaScript injection from the agents, okay, so that, a, and ultimately you can define some of the rules of what URLs you want to monitor and, and, and how uh, you want to do this insertion rate. And, and ultimately, that's in, uh, once that JavaScript insertion, uh, insertion has happened, it will render asynchronously on, on the browser. The first time it will download this, this JavaScript snippet and um, the, the follow-up times it will be cached locally on the browser. And then ultimately what that does is it uses the web timing API to report performance metrics back to our application through the application back to that agent and under that agent. And I can show you some of that example in a, in a, in a demo. Here are some of the application servers that we are supporting as well as the, the browsers. So we support most of, you know, all the most recent browsers out there and as, as well as the application servers available. All right. Um, just because of the, uh, the time, it's already 8.25, what I'll do is I'll just um, hand it over back to Tim uh, for ABA and time permitting. What I'll do is I'll give you a demo of browser response time um, at the end of the session. Uh, so let me just go ahead and pass the presenter rights back to Tim and I'll look to see if there's any Q&A questions um, in the list. Hey, uh, Mark? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so there, there are a few questions. Did you want to answer them um, so people hear about it, or did you want to answer them in the Q&A uh, field? Yeah, no, what I'll do is I'll uh, attempt to uh, answer a few, and while I've, uh, I've just uh, given rights to, um, to Tim while Tim takes it over. And um, uh, so let me see here. Actually, let's, let's go ahead with Tim. I'll, I'll start answering them in the Q&A section, and uh, time permitting, I can have a further, uh, we can further discuss this uh, at the end okay. of uh, the session. Yeah, if we have time, I can review them quickly uh, at the end. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tim Smith uh, from Product Management, and I'm here to introduce the new analytics feature. We're calling it ABA, Application Behavior Analytics. So it's new in 9.5. In fact, it's uh, quite different from anything we've had before or that you'll find in any APM product. The, the key points are these. Um, it's a different type of analysis than what you've seen before. And therefore, it finds things that are unlike what you've been able to discover before. It's easy to use because it's automatic. It also delivers good results because it's automatic. It keeps track of the configuration in your environment and it sends the right things to analysis because it's working on the right data. It produces valid results, but also because it's automated, it's easy to use. It, it allows you to get value from all this data that you're collecting within your APM system. And especially when you have multiple data sources, meaning Interscope agent data, the passive monitoring data from CEM, cloud monitor to do the synthetic transactions, browser response time uh, measurements that Mark just introduced. If you have ADA, application delivery analysis, doing passive monitoring at the TCP layer, that also has a connector to bring it into APM. If you have all these types of data, 
you can, you can grow big data quickly. And how do you make sense of all that? How do you get value from all those different data sources? Well, there are a number of things in APM. You know, there are ways to put the right things on dashboards, and there are custom-built views and workflows that are built in. And now there's one more thing, and that's the analysis, which intentionally analyzes all this data, finds new types of insight, and makes it easy for you to understand. The ultimate benefit is that it, it can help you find root cause faster. Right? So this, this is just a restatement of the problem. We know that you have complex environments, that that's only getting more and more complex as time goes on, and it, it's, it's necessary to uh, push more of the burden on the product. Let the product do the heavy lifting with regard to the analysis and make it easier for you to use it. Right? So what, what we've done is we've taken an advanced statistical modeling engine. It does behavioral learning. It, is, uh, it runs on a new analysis server. So you need to add a server to your cluster environment one analysis server per cluster, or if you have a standalone EM, one analysis server per standalone EM. And that analysis server, you, uh, you run its own, it runs on its own installer. It needs a rather um, uh, large box because the analysis is very intense. It's, it uses a lot of CPU and memory to do all this work. Uh, we're recommending 24 gigs of RAM and a quad-core CPU if you'll be running this on a large cluster. And then it receives data every 15 seconds. The, the mom has a new way to pull data from all of its collectors and package up that data in a format that the analysis can use and send that down to analysis. It's happening every 15 seconds. And then the analysis uh, does a few things. First, it performs correlation analysis. It looks across all the metrics that are sent down, and it, it decides this group of things belong together. It makes that decision on the basis of the correlation analysis. It's been watching over time this whole set of metrics, and here's a group of metrics that belong together. And then here's another group that belong together. And, and metric A could be in both groups, right? But they're, they're the whole set of these clusters or groups that belong together, and then each of them receives a mathematical model, a mathematical expression of the relationships of the metrics that are in that group. Because the whole idea is to understand how things are interacting with other things. And so that's done through a complex mathematical model that expresses these relationships between multiple metrics. And then in real time, as more data arrives, the current pattern the interaction between the, the metrics is compared to the historical patterns, that which has been observed over time and captured in the mathematical model. And if the current behavior does not look sufficiently close to one of the historical patterns, that's an anomaly. It identifies the anomaly, and then you have a way to look at that and understand what it means. So uh, the main point here is it's a different kind of analysis. It's not just threshold-based analysis, which identifies extreme behavior. You know, we, we rely on thresholds a number of places in the product. Those are important, but this is complementary. It's something else that finds a different type of insight. Right? And it works great with multiple data sources, as we just mentioned. The, the, the Introscope and CEM and Cloud Monitor and BRTM and ADA and even uh, EP agent data, whatever you're pulling into your APM system, if it's metric data, it can be analyzed through this uh, analysis. Right? So multiple data sources, as you see across the bottom, one modeling engine analyzing it all together, and then the different users receive uh, value in their own role by knowing where change occurred, what was the impact of that change. And all this is done without having created rules. So you don't need to define rules that say, if you see this, then look over here, or this and that belong together, or I'm looking for this particular thing. Yeah, you don't need to do any of that. It, it's just taking raw data. It's finding things on its own, 
and it shows you where they exist and helps you understand what they mean in the context of your business transaction model. Right? So it works best with multiple data sources. Out of the box, it runs with application data, meaning a subset of the Interscope and CEM data. But then through uh, configuration, you can add in network data, either the cloud monitor synthetic transactions or the application delivery analysis, ADA data. Uh, mainframe works well. So if you're running cross-enterprise APM and you're pulling in metrics from your mainframe, you can analyze that. Uh, infrastructure management data, if you've got a connector to pull that in. Uh, database or even business systems data. And by business systems, I mean point of sale systems, uh, the, you know, the ability to pull in how many widgets were sold during this interval of time, what was the dollar value of the sales. If you have some way to relate business data and pull it in as metrics, then it can be correlated with all this IT systems data, and that helps you to identify how important one, trend or one incident is compared to another. It will find that when this happens, that's when it really hurts the revenue. And, and that's been an interesting thing that some customers are doing. Okay? So it's all about patterns. Uh, and the, the graphic shows you a simple example. Uh, these three metrics are interacting with each other in a certain way, and then the pattern changes. You see that immediately with your eye. right? You can tell that's a new pattern. Now, the interesting thing is that it's multiple metrics, right? It's the combination of these three things interacting with each other, and the change may not involve any threshold violations. The change can be just something different, even though it's not extreme, and it will be it will it will be identified as an anomaly in this <clears throat> in this system. So it's finding both good changes and bad changes. And you, you want that because when you make a planned change, when you upgrade something, you want to know, yes, it had an impact. Here's where the impact is felt. Uh, you can identify the scope of the impact and the magnitude of the impact and essentially measure in terms of performance the return on investment for the projects that you do. But also you want it for uh, incident management. When you have an unexpected change, you want to be able to identify that and identify the scope and the magnitude and indicate root cause and fix it and then be able to tell that the, the fix was effective. Right? So once again, a complement to what's already in APM. The idea is to get more value out of all that big data uh, that you're collecting and storing. Right? So it, it's a learning engine. It begins to learn once you turn it on. It takes a while to understand what the patterns are within your data. If you have a simple environment where everything is smooth and easy to understand, then it learns pretty well after a few hours. But almost nobody has that. You have a lot of change going on and a lot of complex interactions, and it takes a while, often a few days, in order to see the the daily patterns and begin to really understand what those patterns are and to produce good anomalies. Right? But after it's been running for a while, it really is, is uh, very effective at parsing out the difference between spurious correlations and meaningful correlations. It can tell these things really do interact with each other. And, and therefore, when it sees a pattern change and it tells you about it, it it's a meaningful thing. We've had really good results with this. Right? And uh, the last point is this, uh, you'll see in the, in the demo in a minute, the analysis workbench is a new, uh, new tab within the investigator, and you can use it as an anomaly search engine. So you can just go right there and say, in this time frame, what were the anomalies that related to this particular business transaction? And, uh, and then you can begin to uh, go deeper and see find insight with regard to what the root cause may be or what the impact is in your environment. Okay. So I think we've covered this already. There's the analysis workbench, as you'll see in just a minute. We also have notifications on the home page. We'll take a look at that. Okay. So here's a quick tour of the UI before we start the demo. On the home page, which Mark introduced, 
Down in the bottom right is recent notifications, and here's an example where some unusual behaviors, which are happening right now, appear in this notifications pane. Each one of these unusual behaviors has a score between 0 and 100. How anomalous is this pattern compared to the historical patterns? And how many application components are interacting with each other? And when you mouse over one of these behaviors, it tells you which application components are involved in the anomaly. So for instance, if you've been watching the login transaction, you know you're having trouble with that, you want to know when something unusual happens with login, you know, and what transaction is more important than that. If people cannot get into the system, then no productivity happens. So you, you may want to watch login, you see an unusual behavior, it has a high anomaly score, it involves login, then you just double click and it opens up the workbench and allows you to dig into that anomaly. So here's the workbench. Notice it's part of Investigator. The way it works is you, uh, to use it as a search engine, you give it a time range. I want to know the anomalies that happened in this particular range or that are happening right now if you put it on you know, last hour or so. And then you can set application context. You can tell it, look for anomalies involving this business transaction or this application component or even a metric name. Show me the, met the uh, anomalies that involve errors, you know, error metrics. And then once you set that context, then it populates a list of matching anomalies they usually come in bunches, right, because again, there are multiple clusters of things that belong together. So you'll see here uh, a bunch of anomalies started at about the same time. And when you click on any one of these, then it populates the rest of the page, beginning with the list of participating components. So these are application components that uh, would exist on your app map if you're running app map. And you can look at those one by one. They all have a checkbox. So you can unclick everything, look one by one at the app components, see which metrics are part of that component and have been identified as abnormal. Here's the list of individual metrics. They also have checkboxes, so you can turn them off. And when you click, click one of these and uh, uncheck it, then its graph disappears from above. Uh, notice that we give you not only the metric name, but we tell you which app component it came from. And over on the right, there's a little metadata, deviation and association. Deviation tells you how far this metric is from its own baseline during this time frame. If it's doing something unusual, just considering its own history, it, you know, this particular response time is not supposed to be in this neighborhood you know, during this time, then you get a high deviation. Association is how tightly associated it is with the anomaly itself. If this response time went unusual at the same time the anomaly started, and if it settled down to normal when the anomaly ended, then it would have very high association. If, if there is some strange behavior for this particular metric during the time frame, but it's not closely correlated with the anomaly itself, then this score would be lower. Right? So this helps you understand metric by metric, um, but, but don't necessarily think that uh, correlation is causation. You know, just because something is tightly correlated, it might just be a sympathetic response. It could be that this metric reacts greatly to the anomaly without being the cause of the anomaly. It takes a little more analysis to parse out the difference between cause and effect. Right, and then we have the multi-metric graph. We deliberately do not show any uh, markings on the y-axis. Uh, because we put multiple types of metrics on the graph at one time. The purpose is to see the pattern. And this one's a really simple example, two metrics that have a positive correlation. They're going up and down together. Right? And one of them, in this case, is concurrent invitations. Uh, you know, that's a count, one, two, three, four. And then response time, measured in milliseconds. But we, we put these two very different units of measure on the same graph because the idea is to see the pattern. 
and you'll see an example in a minute. We want you to visualize the anomaly. I mean, this picture already tells quite a lot. Everything was going along normal and fine according to a smooth pattern, and then at this abrupt point in time, which happens to be the time of the anomaly, then we get a new pattern between these guys, and they now and they have that positive correlation, up, down, up, down. Right? So that helps to reveal some insight. Right? So now is uh, a good time to remind you that this is different from thresholds. Right? We use thresholds a number of places in, the, in APM, and that's good because you need to know about extreme behavior, but ABA is different. It's about patterns. It's about anomalies. It's about relationships. When did things change? Right? So it, it allows you to get more insight, you know, shine a light on the interesting things as a complement to what you already have, and it, it multiplies the value of your data. You get, you know, with zero config, without having to build dashboards or thresholds or rules, you still get value from having all that data and making it interact with the other data and finding the correlations and, and the interesting things. Okay? So with that, I want to move to a demo. I'm going to switch over to share my desktop. And, and this is an instance of WebView. I'm looking at last hour. And in the last hour, make sure that I'm up to speed. So in the last hour, I see from the home page that the view product transaction has the worst response time by far. And account, sign on, view product, and view category are all in red status. So I could do the workflow that Mark showed. I could drill down, for instance, go to view product, uh, let me isolate on view product. Uh, Notice that uh, the red dot appears on this app component. Drill down and view the health metrics for that component just to show the workflow. Remember, Mark got you here also. And, and then you see uh, real quickly an interesting thing. One agent reports very different response time than the other agents and, and has uh, quite a lot of volume, more of a concurrency issue. You may want to inspect why one agent is different from the others. You know, if one host was, uh, received some treatment, the others did not. Uh, so we have those type of workflows. We can also do the drill down uh, from the graph. And it, it, iso it helps me understand right away view product, which had the really bad response time, shows up on this response time graph as well. And I can drill down there and, and do the workflow that, that Mark also showed. Um, but we can also go to the investigator, look at the analysis workbench, and let's see, let me expand out a little bit, make sure that I can find this, see if anomaly happened on that same issue. Okay, it, is, it, it just went a little older than an hour. so. I had to go to two hours to find it, but it, here's an anomaly. It's the same one that Mark was showing to you. It started at, uh, I'm on Central Time, so it's saying 9.33 Central Time is when it started, and things were pretty smooth until that time, close to the 9.33 in the morning, and then there's a lot of change. So I can see it in the graph, but what does it mean? Well, I'm going to analyze it by clicking over here, removing everything from the right side, and then we'll just go down the list. Server resources. Here's an unusual CPU utilization. It just means compared to the normal patterns, when this much load and these things are going on, the system expected to see, in this case, probably more CPU than what it was showing. Because it's not that that spike is really all that big. I can tell how big it is by doing the drill down go look at the real graph and see it only went to 20%. That's not extreme for CPU utilization, but it's not expected in the interaction that's going on right now between all these components. So that's not likely the root cause of anything. 20% CPU is not an issue. Let me look at a few of these transactions because several of them have unusual um, behavior. 
Here's a response time that's going along. It did not go up and peak. Uh, it, you know, just a spike here and there and an error. Again, to understand how bad was the response time, I just take this button, which takes me over to Metric Browser. I see the actual graph, and I see that the response time in this case uh, is still quite fast, not a real issue. That metric isn't doing much. I'll go back to the analysis workbench. We'll look at another business transaction. This one's a little more interesting because an error, which let me make this easier, look at them one at a time. The error spikes up, and that's when the response time degrades. So how many errors was that? Is that a big issue? I make a simple click. It's, a, it's only three errors. I may want to look into that further. Uh, I always like to go up here to the overview when looking at a, at a transaction. The response time really didn't change much. Yes, the error happened. There was a small change in response time. Maybe the interaction is unusual. The fact that errors occurred on this transaction might be uh, unusual in and of itself, but that's not a real big story to tell. Let me keep looking at other transactions. Here, a drop in throughput. This one, another correlation between two things. Here's a, a spike in an error as well as a drop in throughput. So perhaps that one's interesting. Here's another one. But I want to focus on this last one. View product, if you will recall, was the one we found from home page that had the really bad response time. So let's look at them one by one and understand the pattern. The response time goes up. The throughput goes down. There's a spike in errors, which comes just at the time everything starts happening. So perhaps that's causative. The concurrency goes up and the stalls go up. And to see it in its normal place, I can take any one of these metrics over to Metric Browser with a simple click. I'm going to go to the overview for that business transaction, and I see the story. At one point in time, which is the time of the anomaly, the response time degrades, the throughput goes down, the concurrency goes up, there's a spike in errors, and we start getting stalls. And, and then from here, I would go deeper. I would look at the trace analysis, the error analysis. I would possibly go to the agent that was performing worse than the other agents and look at a thread dump. I'd start to put together the various diagnostic features of APM to take this story down to root cause. And in that, may I remind you, we did from the workbench because it found that all these things together have interactions that are not according to normal patterns. It found this on its own. It made it easy to tell the rest of the story and help find interactions. Now, uh, in this particular case, I could have figured out everything right from home page, and that's good. But sometimes you find something in the, in the analysis workbench that indicates a relationship between various business transactions. Uh, a common dependency on some authentication system or some third-party uh, web service. You can find correlations that you may not have known that could explain why the behavior changed in multiple places at the same time. Right. So that gives you a flavor of, of what we've done with the home page and the investigator. I mean, do a real quick uh, browser response time uh, story that uh, that Mark mentioned. I'm going to go down to this particular dashboard because it shows some browser response time metrics. Uh, and I like this one because it has multiple sources. The, the synthetic monitoring from Cloud Monitor. Do I have a location issue where uh, one of my monitoring stations from around the world is different from the others? No. Everything seems to be behaving in a relatively smooth manner. If I have hooked up my application delivery analysis, monitoring the corporate WAN and looking at uh, the delivery of apps out to the branch offices, it would populate here and I'd see if I have a location problem identified by the network monitoring. I can look at the CEM transactions down here, but I want to concentrate on the client side, which is our browser response time monitoring. If I take a drill down, it takes me to the BRTM metrics. I like to look at them all together in the overview. And then from here, I can tell a story. 
here's throughput at the time of this incident, because I'm still looking at the same incident. And you, know, and you can notice here, get the tool tip, um, that it's still looking at, it's looking at view product, or we've been concentrating. And the, as measured at the browser, we see the drop in responses per interval. That's the drop in throughput. We see that uh, the, the browser uh, render time is, uh, is higher, you know, for a at least a little while. There's a spike here in browser render time. But for the most part, the problem does not identify itself on the browser. The DOM construction time, time waiting until first paint, is almost identical to total page load time. If there's not much delta between these two, then by the time the browser gets the content, it draws the page, you're done. It notices there, there was an issue, and certainly these times are not like the past, so there's something going on at the time of the incident, but it doesn't appear to be an issue with, the, with browsers, or the application is not tickling the browser in a way to cause, cause an issue. It, it's a data center or a network issue from this perspective, and you know, we learned from here it appears to be a, an application issue. Something about that uh, view product loaded on one of the, uh, one of the hosts behaving different, and we need to go further with error analysis and trace analysis and figure out what it is. Right? So uh, with that, I'd like to um, uh, open up for questions and answers uh, or any uh, final comments that Mark may want to make before we go to the, to the Q&A. Mark? Yeah, so I've been answering a lot of the questions online. If I haven't answered your questions, if you want to come online and ask the question, feel free, or if there's any other questions you would like us uh, to answer, uh, please, please go ahead and unmute yourself, or maybe we can have uh, Stephanie unmute the lines. Um, all the answers are under the Q&A tabs, and we're going to continue to answer them and share them with our community. Uh, and as we mentioned at the beginning, the deck, uh, as well as this recording, will also be available on uh, the, the archive section in our community groups. So Mark, hey, this is Manish. Uh, are you guys going to go ahead and take all the Q&A uh, offline and answer them and put it on the community web page? Yeah, absolutely, Manish. I'm going to down through the list. Um, I'm, I've I got another probably eight or so to go through, right. um, some of them including ABA and others. But uh, yeah, I'm, we're going to go down through the list. We're going to answer them all and make sure they are available to uh, the attendees. Okay. So if it helps you any, if you want to answer them uh, verbally, that makes it quicker or not. I don't know. Yeah, we can we can we can certainly do that. Um, uh, Tim, here, here's the one that I was at here. Can we alert? Uh, can we alert based on on the deviations uh, for? Uh, I'm assuming they're they're talking about a metric deviation that associated to an anomaly. Okay, anomalies themselves are are not alertable. However, all the normal alert mechanisms of APM are still there. So if you if you dig into a particular anomaly and you realize it's a problem with this metric you can set an alert on that metric. But you, uh, we do not, at this point in the introduction of this new feature, we are not allowing an alert to occur just because there is a new anomaly. Remember that uh, there are anomalies for any kind of change. If something changes in your environment, some interaction is different from historical patterns, you're going to get an anomaly. There are changes in your environment all the time and many of them are benign. They don't hurt anything. You don't want to be alerted to those things. So because we're currently alerting to both good and bad change, it doesn't deserve alerting, and it's not a feature that we have now. We, I need to put some additional things in this feature before we could allow alerting on anomalies, but we're not there yet. All right, so the next question uh, is from David Lukes. Uh, what kind of work? Uh, it's involved migrating Wally 908 data to 95 APM product. Uh, I'll go ahead and answer that. So ultimately, the, the data will be uh, through any, any typical upgrade that you've done. Uh, 908 to 95 will be upgradable. Uh, you don't have to upgrade your agents, of course. And once you've upgraded to the 9.5, you'll be able to take advantage of the new web UI as well as uh, an option to deploy the uh, application behavior analytics. Um, if you want to take advantage of browser response time monitoring, you will have to upgrade the agents um, on those application servers. Uh, regarding home page dashboards, uh, can those metrics alerts filtered by agents or applications? 
um, so similar to the console lens. So we don't we don't support a console lens at this point in time. We will be evolving uh, the, the the home page uh, to include more filters capability by by applications, by services, by transactions, etc. But for now, uh, we do. If you do have our um, authorization engine uh, implemented, so uh, uh, embedded entitlement manager. Uh, if your users only have access to a subset of the applications, those app, uh, those um, related transactions, business transactions, will be filtered out of, out of that page. Uh, and the same thing goes with application components. Um, and depending on your your access rights, uh, you will not see those um, uh, application components and, and alerts in the home page. Um, so from Indica, uh, RCA, uh, RCA have enhancements to monitor another program language such as PHP. Uh, so P PHP is on the roadmap. Um, uh, it's in our backlog. Uh, as I mentioned in one of the responses, we fully it's a, it's a, we're now a year and a half now in our adoption of Agile. Um, so as we you know as, as customers provide us with these priorities through Idea Vision, I uh, certainly hope that everybody in our community is familiar with Idea Vision. Um, we, we take that very seriously and we're, we're, we're putting that as part of our backlog, prioritizing it accordingly. And um, we're also, well, we're also going to educate our, our, our customers and our, you know, around when, when we do um, adopt some of these new technologies in our, in our upcoming releases. So PHP is there, it's highly ranked, and uh, we're, we're hoping to see it, see it, see it there very, very soon. Um, I lost audio again. Okay, I'm in. No. Mark, Mark, let me jump in with one more point about the analytics. Uh, we are currently in uh, customer validation phase uh, because it's a new feature. We will put out a new version of analytics in about one month. So right now we're uh, providing extra help to the customers who are trying it out, and then uh, when next month uh, the new version comes out, it'll it'll be open and, and available to everyone without uh, the customer validation program. The, the the way that we're delivering analytics is by way of an add-on. So you install 9.5, it won't have the analytics in there. You call support and you say, I want the add-on for analytics, and then they will uh, hook you up with me and we'll get the code to you. It's an add-on that you run, a separate installer that you put down, and it, it adds this to your product, and there you go. Hey, Tim, just to follow up on that, the, there's a question around analy the analysis server. Can it is it supported on virtual environments? Yes, it is. You can you can uh, host your analysis server on a VM, but it does need a lot of system resource memory and CPU. Okay, and there's a, well, there's one more question around BRTM and its overhead. So uh, uh, all the BRTM injections are uh, you can throttle them and you can configure where you insert the BRTM, um, and there was a, a, a follow-up question to that around the timing or where does the performance uh, metrics come from, and they come from the client's um, uh, desktop, right, uh, based on um, uh, the web timing APIs that are, are provided, that are providing these performance statistics. That's what we're leveraging in, in some of the latest and greatest browsers. Uh, so I think that answers that question. I'm trying to go through down through the list. Um, so from Michael, it says, uh, with, with, the web, uh, with the web interface, is there an option to show min-max on the line graphs? Uh, no, not at this point. You can't see min-max, but it is certainly, uh, we've heard loud and clear from our internal uh, users and from our customers that is a top-rated um, feature. So uh, we, are, we have it on our backlog, and it's highly, highly uh, ranked. Um, ABA question, um, can ABA learn and consider off-hours business transactions uh, because most of the applications and customer facing um, and during non-business hours, um, the transactions are very, are, are, are very less and during business hours they are higher. So based on the transaction throughput. And, and the answer is right now there's not a way to block out intervals of time. It, it will develop its pattern for what normally happens during off hours. There will be patterns that relate to off hours and patterns that relate to busy times. And if you have an off hours pattern that is not like other off hours patterns, it will tell you about it. 
Uh, so that's how we have it right now. We're going to run with that and see if that's the right answer. Uh, but I am considering putting in the ability to block out intervals of time where you can say, I always have a change window from midnight until 3 a.m., ignore that interval of time every day. Or I know that a particular thing is coming up, I, I want to ignore all of next Tuesday. Uh, but right now that's not in there. It learns on everything. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, I think on that note, Manish, um, I think uh, we're already over time. Uh, what, what, what I will do, uh, Tim and I will go through the remaining uh, responses. We'll make sure to answer them and make sure to share them with the community. Um, please, again, take the time and vote uh, for some of the enhancement requests. Um, the survey was shared at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Uh, we'll make sure to share it again uh, through our communities. Uh, Manish, do you want to wrap it up with anything else? Yeah. Um, no, no. Just like I said, we'll We'll definitely make sure you guys get to the Q&A and we'll post it. Uh, if you guys can just take a quick poll and, uh, you know, once you guys finish to fulfill that, we can go ahead and end the webcast. We'll give about a few seconds to, to poll. And I'd like to go ahead and thank you, Mike and uh, Mark and Tim, for your time. Uh, really appreciate you guys coming on the webcast and uh, giving us an overview. Um, and we'll definitely keep you guys in the loop with the community. Okay, well, it was a pleasure to present to you, and uh, we, we believe we have a really solid release here. We're looking for some good stories from you as, as you start running this, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right, thank you, guys. Thanks, uh, community, and uh, keep an eye on the web, uh, for the questions on the, uh, on the community webpage to be answered. Thank you. You guys have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect your line.